Welcome everybody to the Lindholm Democracy Talks. This is a launch for the very first time of this event. My name is Urban Strandberg. I'm the co-founder and uh, managing director of International Youth Think Tank. So the heading of today is power to the people. And what we are going to do for one hour is to discuss uh, what it, the potentials are to energize democracy in Sweden, Europe and in the world through citizens panels. So that is what it's all about. And um, I welcome you who are in the room here with us today at Eldrummet, Lindholm and Science Park. I welcome you who are joining us online because you have found us uh, on the internet. And I also welcome you who are participants in Frihamsdagarna, which is another event running in Gothenburg today. So welcome to you all. So, um, so that is the background of today's event. Um, the International Youth Think Tank, which I mentioned, I co-founded and managed, is a new organization which has the aim to promote democracy. We think that democracy need to promote it because, well, authoritarian ideas are gaining ground in Europe and in the world, but also since people with less power tools uh, need to be getting better power tools. So the um, think tank want to promote democracy for everybody. And we do this by inviting youth. We define youth as people who are in between 18 and 24, and we invite them to us. We, I, we invite them to come to youth conferences, and we say, we trust you to have brilliant new ideas on how to make democracy work better than it does already. And they present democracy proposals. And we say to them, well, you have been working hard for a conference, and for that matter, they come from more than 40 countries, so we have a great coverage. Anyway, when they have presented the proposals at the conferences, we say to them, why don't you stay engaged in the think tank through a year to develop, to scrutinize, and to present the proposals by engaging with scholars, by engaging with other youth in Europe, and with uh, by engaging with the citizens, so that the final proposals, which are presented as policy briefs, are really, really thoroughly uh, thought out. And this is what we do today. We present one of our policy briefs, which is about citizens' assemblies. So this first democracy, Lindemann Democracy Talk, which is about power to the people, is presenting the, the, the culmination, you could say, of very hard work done by our, the, our youth fellows. So you will learn quite much about citizens' assemblies through presentations, and by the end of the, um, this uh, hour, I will open the floor for questions and, uh, and comments. So thank you, and once again, welcome. So this was my welcome words, and we have two uh, distinguished uh, persons that want to say some opening remarks before we uh, ask the presenters to the floor. So first, Tord Hermansson, please. Welcome to the floor. Tord is CEO at Lindholm and Science Park, where we presently are uh, at this very specific site. And Lindholm and Science Park is graciously hosting the think tank. So Tord, good to see you. And please, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Urban. Ladies and gentlemen, here and online, well, warm welcome to Lindholm and Science Park. Uh, we have, since 20 years, developed a dynamic and inspiring arena for open innovation. Uh, Lindholm and Science Park support the innovative power of Sweden, focusing on the mobility of tomorrow, digitalization, visualization, but also applied AI. So we are very proud to be ex and excited to host this new concept uh, initiating the concept of the democracy talks. This will enable a new interface between the, the innovation activities, sustainable development, and, and the impact on democracy. So, so in other words, to enable a true society system perspective. Lindholm Science Park has the objective to be a world-class host organization. And I think with this, new concept, we are taking one important step in that direction. So I'm very happy and interested to get this thing started. So with that, over to you. 
Thank you, Tord. And before I, I invite the next remarks, I just want to say that what you see uh, on the screen is the youth fellows which came to Gothenburg for our first conference in 2019. So these are the guys who have developed the proposals, and one of them is here today and will be one of the presenters. So this is the proof of the pudding, you could say. So now I invite to the floor Cecilia Malmström, who happens to be the co-founder together with me of the IYTT and also part of the International Reference Group. You recognize Cecilia because she has been formerly uh, EU Commissioner for Trade. She's a doctor of political science and she's currently serving as a, as a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute in Washington, D.C. Cecilia, it's so good to have you here. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Urban. Hello, everybody here and online. Thank you, Tord, for hosting us. It's great uh, to be here, really. Last weekend, I was in Poland. Poland is a wonderful country in many ways, but it has a lot of problems with the current government. I was at a summer camp uniting 1,000 young people from all over the country, and they gathered for four days to discuss a variety of options, a variety of subjects and themes. One of them, democracy. How can we modernize democracy? How can we take back democracy? How can young people's voice be heard in the future of democracy? And this is in a country where there is severe threats to the independence of rule of law, where there is severe threat to the independence of academia, to uh, freedom of press, and where there is harassment uh, for min on minorities, and uh, not least to LGBTI people. So it is doubtful whether Poland can be called a democracy today. And these people were there and they were full of energy. There were no political affiliations. They just wanted to formulate ideas and to meet with different people uh, from different sectors to discuss and see what uh, a brighter future could be about. And Poland is not alone. We have the same problems in neighboring Hungary. Hungary. And during the pandemic, actually, democracy has taken a big step back all over the world. Under the um, protection of the COVID, many governments have decided to rule by decree. They have limited freedom of speech, opposition, freedom of press. We see uh, a denial of science, etc. This has happened all over the world. And it has also reinforced the trend in countries who were already on that path before China, Russia, Belarus, the list is long. But the good news are that there are young people all over the world who want to change this, who want to challenge this, who want to say that democracy needs to develop, it needs to improve, it needs to refresh, it needs to modernize. And that's why I'm such a proud co-founder together with Urban of this think tank, these people and many more who do this. They don't only talk, they discuss and they come with concrete ideas and propose them, present them to policy makers, decision makers of different kinds. And one of these ideas we will hear today, I think it's fascinating, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to hear more, more detailed. And this is the way forward, I think, because the future belongs to the young generation and democracy can never be taken for granted, even in countries who are formerly democracies, it still needs to constantly develop, modernize, and uh, be challenged and discussed. And that's why I'm looking very much forward to democracy talks in general, but especially this proposal today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so very much. So now we will have uh, three presentations in a row, and uh, all of them are covering different uh, aspects on how the IYTT is working and how we are trying to bring good substantiation for our proposals. So I will call for the first and uh, well, and you will have to be with us not having the possibility of commenting or questioning uh, in between because when we throw them in a row. So remember your questions and we will take them afterwards. So the first presenter is Erik Torshak, uh, who now uh, enters uh, the stage. Erik has an MA degree in history of uh, IDs and he serves as um, associate fellow of the IYTT and he has been uh, in the project since a couple of years now, been moderators at the youth conferences. And uh, Erik, you will speak on the current youth attitudes and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Urban. Um, well, I have already been introduced. Uh, Erik Torsak, my name. Um, I'm very happy to see you here today at our first Lindholm and Democracy Talks. 
Um, I will be saying a few words about our European Youth Panel and their thoughts on citizens' assemblies. So, uh, let me start with talking a little bit about the European Youth Panel. Uh, these are young people um, from all over Europe that have shown interest in our yearly youth conference, but they have not had the opportunity to attend. Uh, not yet, anyway. We hope that they might in the future. Um, in other words, this is not just anyone, but rather this is young people that have a certain interest in, in issues of democracy and the open society. Um, oh, sorry. Um, as you see, it's uh, 120 participants from uh, 32 different countries. And this, this particular survey that we did, um, it has a quite low response rate, only 15%. And uh, so from a statistical standpoint, our, our survey is not very useful. I mean, it's firstly, the selection is not representative and that the panelists are um, most likely have an interest in these issues beforehand. And secondly, uh, the questions we ask are pretty complex, which means I believe that a lot of people feel that they are too difficult to discuss, actually. Um, however, to us, uh, this is not necessarily a flaw, uh, but possibly a feature, because what we, what we feel that we get is a sounding board for the ideas and concepts that we work on in the think tank. And we get to probe the minds of young people that are uh, that are interested in these issues, that are sort of the, the avant-garde, if you will, of the development of democracy. So, moving on to the survey itself, uh, we present the concept of citizens' assemblies to our panel in the following way. In parliamentary democracies, politicians are appointed through general elections. In recent years, some countries have also organized citizens' assemblies. These are chosen randomly, accounting for gender, age, and other factors to ensure similarity to the citizenry as a whole. The citizens' assemblies deliberate current political issues and are given the time and resources to explore them. Finally, the assemblies give recommendations to politicians on a course of action. This is, of course, a very brief background on the topic. The idea is that we allow for personal experience and um, previous understanding to uh, inform the, the answers. The first question we ask is pretty straightforward. Do you believe that citizens' assemblies would have an impact on political decisions? And as you can see, uh, quite a lot of people, quite a lot of the uh, panelists agree. They, they think that yes, in fact, they could. Um, and a smaller portion uh, says no. But as already mentioned, this survey is really not about the figures. The really interesting part is that we allow the uh, respondents to elaborate on their thoughts in free text. And we have received a great many interesting thoughts and reflections, uh, too many to present here today, but I, will, I have picked one of them, uh, which I found especially interesting, and that's actually one of the respondents that answered uh, in the negative, that no, they do not believe that citizen assemblies would influence politics. And the person says, no, these assemblies would only impact decisions if the electoral system permits holding accountable specific, a specific politician. If there isn't a manner to hold an individual accountable, their proposals will only be taken into consideration and will only be carried out if beneficial to the politicians. Sometimes unpopular policies are the most effective in the long term, but these are never carried out as politicians are forced to focus on the short term. So what we see here is the concern that decision makers will fail to comply with the recommendations made by citizens' assemblies. And that citizens' assemblies, without the power to make actually binding decisions, 
would prove ineffective. And that is a very real risk, of course. But if we move on to the next question, we ask whether, do you believe that citizens' assemblies would improve the quality of political decisions? So we're talking about the actual quality, whatever that means when it comes to politics. Um, and here as well, a large portion agrees that yes, they probably would, most likely. And here I have picked one of the answers, the affirmative answers. And it goes like this. Yes, because they provide an effective means of confronting people with hard choices and getting the public to engage with the issues from an important perspective. They can help government ministers make tough choices by giving them a sense of what an informed public want, what they feel is fair and what they could accept, thus potentially unlocking politically difficult issues. Um, oh, uh, notes keep sticking together. Um, so what we find here is actually uh, an idea that brings a different perspective to the relationship between citizen assemblies and elected politicians, namely that they could help elected politicians to make the really hard decisions that the other ways possibly would not dare to make. Question number three then, we phrase like this. Do you believe that citizens' assemblies would enhance the influence of people that are less well represented through regular parliamentary democracy? And as you can see, uh, the trend is continuing. Not that I take too much, uh, put too much focus on the figures, but still interesting to see that a lot of people, a lot of the our respondents agree. Uh, however, I picked one of the most interesting answers that was negative and uh, it's phrased like this. No, although the members of citizen assemblies may be random choices, yet the meaningful engagement within them requires for a set of resources, time and desire to actively participate in discussions. Thus, the part of society which are underrepresented in our ordinary parliamentary processes will still face similar constraints. Meaning, the way I interpret it anyway, basically that citizen assemblies will continue to give influence to the same kind of people who are already has influence. That is basically people who are privileged, who are well informed and well spoken, which is of course a critical point that would need to be addressed in any form of implementation of citizen assemblies. The fourth and final question we asked our panelists was, do you believe that citizens' assemblies would increase trust and interest in political decision-making among the general public? And here again, a uh, very large portion asked, uh, answered yes. And I picked one of those, short but still interesting. Um, yes, to the extent that they bring together a representative sample of the population in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, social class, and place of residence, which I, in a way, interpret as a conditional yes, meaning that citizens' assemblies, in fact, can increase trust, but only so far as they are able to encompass all different kinds of people in the society. And with that, uh, there's also a, um, an interesting uh, link to the, the previous answer really, uh, in that they put together the idea of trust with the idea of equal representation, um, which was sort of challenged uh, as we saw on the previous slide. Anyway, with that, I will uh, conclude my brief uh, overview of the results from our European Youth Panel and uh, uh, hand the word back over to Urban. Thank you so much, Eric, for a stunning presentation. And just underline for, for all of you in the audience, this is only one example of questions that we sent to our own barometer. I mean, this is the youth barometer of the IYTT. We have sent out already several rounds, and we are preparing a next round this 
this fall early fall semester so keep an eye open and see what our youth in the panel come up with when we ask them to reflect on on the future of democracy so inviting now john guy john guy is an american uh, he's uh, part of the think tank as a research fellow he is a postdoc scholar uh, being both an architect uh, a degree in architecture and a degree in urban sociology, extremely well read, and his uh, task within the think tank is to be a moderator in the youth conferences, but um, uh, the most important thing is to be the research fellow, so he will today present the first working paper that we have issued, uh, picking out one of the proposals of, of last year's conference. So John, very welcome and please, the floor is all yours now. Thank you, Urban. <clears throat> I'm Jonathan Geib. I'll be presenting, as Urban mentioned, the think tank's first working paper, Dynamics of Instituting Many Publics for a More Participatory Democracy. It's the result of a six-week research overview I conducted. Uh, it generates a wider context of theory and practice uh, to inform the youth fellows' development of their proposal, which they'll present next. <clears throat> it's worth repeating um, that anxieties about democracy have been growing for some time and have intensified in recent years with escalating global crises. Uh, what's called democratic deficits are worsening. Citizens are not involved enough in decision making about policies which affect them, uh, and those policies are not responsive enough to public opinion. Among the historical trends this is part of, to mention a few, uh, the a fragmenting of society and political party parties, declining trust, and recent authoritarian manipulation of democracy. So given the poor performance of actual democracies, it's tempting to ask, like this article, is democracy getting in the way? <clears throat> Why not have an elite group of technocrats solve our extreme problems? But let's look at the case for optimism. Uh, discontent can be seen as a sign of democracy's vitality. We're aiming for something better. The declines of the last 40 years uh, have helped produce what's called today's deliberative wave an explosion of theory and practice around deliberation and participation. Uh, but perhaps the key is to be more precise with our anxiety. Our discontent is perhaps better targeted at representative democracy, which has actually comprised only about 7% of democracy's history. Uh, the rest uh, is comprised has been comprised of variations of what has what is called assembly democracy. Uh, this is very interesting in relation to the relative success of recent citizens assemblies. These and other many publics, which I'll describe shortly, have become very popular in democratic theory and practice for their potential to counter democratic deficits. So, what are citizens assemblies? They're deliberative forums of about 100 to 160 citizens who are randomly selected and filtered to reflect the overall population. In an independently facilitated process, they hear witnesses, investigate, deliberate, and make recommendations on public issues in order to improve decision making and inform public opinion. They are one form of what's called mini public, a mini public or a, a miniature version of the public. They require a relatively large time commitment, 20 to, 20 to 30 work days spread over up to a year. As mentioned, they're facilitated. Participants are typically paid. Participants are not meant to represent their own or others pre-existing opinions. This is a key point, but they're meant to further develop their thinking in a collective process hearing diverse opinions. To give you a sense, a few images, this is from the Irish Citizens Assembly of 2017. Citizens Assembly on the Future of Scotland from this year. The Citizens Convention on Climate last year in France. So 
citizens' assemblies are particularly well suited to taking on complex, contentious issues which tend to be avoided by politicians. The relatively long length um, leads to high quality deliberation and recommendations. Because their selection is random, they are accessible to all equally, all citizens. Being citizen led limits undue influence of, of money and power. Their diversity of participants produces more ideas and better solutions than a more homogenous group would. Being a collective rather than a competitive process generates a certain sociality which cultivates open-mindedness and tolerance and actually has been shown to reduce group, po group polarization. All of these lead to better public decision-making. The challenge is that while these assemblies are successful internally as processes, they often fail to influence politicians or the public. Three responses to this challenge uh, shape the working paper. One, empower citizens, citizens' assemblies through formal institutionalization. This is also the recommendation of the OECD. Two, adopt a systemic view which enables seeing how these processes co-develop within larger systems, within the larger system of public opinion, civil society, media, politicians, and so on. Three, empower broader citizen participation beyond the assembly by increasing the public's understanding and involvement. This is important in relation to the critique of these assemblies that they potentially function as shortcuts which undermine the ideal of self-governance and long-term sustainability of policy. With these aims in mind, the paper focuses on key dynamics to consider when instituting many publics. Instituting is considered in two senses, as enacting a one-time process and as formally institutionalizing such processes. But why focus on dynamics? Well, to be strategic, Certain system dynamics can be crucial to the assembly's effectiveness. Uh, also for normative reasons to engage and empower citizenry, the citizenry beyond the mini public and to be agile, to be more responsive to citizens and to societal change. There are numerous dynamics to consider and the paper describes them with the support of case examples. I list them here brief, briefly, but I'll select just a few a few to highlight. When enacting a one-time process, many publics can better engage citizens by communicating with the public and integrating their input in the process. Some participants can act as ambassadors to the public. Experts and stakeholder witnesses are a key aspect. Here, more diverse perspectives can be involved and critical thinking training can aid participants in recognizing witness bias. More generally, many publics can improve public communication by more actively engaging the media in a transparent way. When formally institutionalizing many publics, citizens can be better engaged by anchoring the many public, not just in law, but in culture by informing and edu educating the citizenry and getting buy-in across the political spectrum. The, the importance of this was underscored in the case of Madrid's city observatory, which was great, but it was disbanded in less than a year after a change in city government. Many publics can combine variations of institutionalization as in the Oost Belgian model, which combines citizens panels, assemblies and initiatives in a in an integrated system. Governance can be better engaged through, for example, <clears throat> calling an assembly before a, uh, before a referendum to inform citizens. And finally, many publics can better re-engage with democratic qualities by, for instance, correcting for self-selection biases. Participants are ultimately volunteering. This, is, this can be done with pay, with mandatory participation, and better recruitment. So in conclusion, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. A broad transformation of the citizenry is required in the long term, and the papers focus on dynamics and their variability aimed to support contextual pursuits of a more participatory democracy.
The, the paper is available at iythinktank.com under publications. Thank you. John, amazing presentation. So many great things that you uh, showed us in this presentation. And producing this during six weeks intense research overview uh, effort is absolutely stunning. And for those of you who, well, take an interest in this, John will now continue to pursue ways forward uh, in, in writing up research applications for the IYTT because, well, this is the way we do it. The youth come up with the ideas, they develop them, and then through the help of such uh, uh, skilled scholars like John, we bring in the scholarly knowledge to be really, really convincing when we present the final the final uh, uh, policy briefs. Finally, uh, the research done by John was fun funded by the Ordlebertska Research Foundation. We are grateful for that funding. So thank you, John. And now I invite the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Lisa Mastio. And as it happens, if you were, um, if you were attentive to one of the first uh, slides, she was one of all the lovely faces uh, showing all the conference participants of the 2019 conference. So Lisa is from Germany and she's studying for the second year now in Copenhagen for a degree, master's degree in, in political science. So she went up early morning, really early morning in Copenhagen to take the train to Gothenburg to be along with us. And she's one of the authors of the of one of the first policy brief that the IYTT produced this very spring. And Lisa, uh, we are so happy. I'm so happy that you are here today that you can represent the group of authors and that you can present your policy brief on how to bring out the best you can see from the citizens assemblies. Thank you and a welcome and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Urban. Yeah, as Urban said, I would like to present to you the policy brief on community assemblies. And as we heard a lot already today, is that de democratic fatigue and democratic disenchantment became crucial issues within the last years. Therefore, we see in recent data that on the one hand, the support for democracy in Europe is high, but on the other hand, people feel they have little or even no influence in politics. This leads to a rise of authoritarian and extremist ideas. Therefore, for us, the question of course, how can we increase the influence of average citizens like we are in politics without changing the entire system? As a solution, we propose community assemblies as a complement to representative democracy. This should be established through citizens forums working together on a local level to solve local issues which they consider as important. Participants of community assemblies are selected through stratified random sampling, as we heard before, to be representative to the community and to ensure diversity. The objective is a threefold. First, group thinking and elaboration with Participants of diverse backgrounds will improve the quality of policies as well as the responsiveness of the policies, policies to the local community. Second, community assemblies open up a new way for citizens to participate in democracy beyond elections. Third, facilitating a, a diverse environment for deliberation by focusing on solving issues through policies rather than politics. We based our proposal, as we also heard before, on Jonathan's research overview and the input from citizens' panels. For example, we got input from a group of nine women who live in the area of Leufjarden. <laughs> I hope I pronounced it kind of correctly. Um, and these women all have different backgrounds and they meet weekly to discuss important issues. And they gave us feedback on our policy proposal and they support this proposal. And they especially support the first of four stages I would like to present to you now. The first stage is the training or education of the participants. So we think it's important that critical thinking is taught and the legislative system by itself. 
this ensures the ability to engage and to set a level playing field. So with this, no good idea gets lost due to the lack of experience or confidence. The second stage is the first deliberation. We can divide it in three parts. The first is brainstorming on local issues. The second is prioritize which proposals need more attention. And the third is the development of the proposals. Especially, but in all stages, it is really important that it's teamwork. There should be no repetition of party lines. On the third stage, which is called public outreach and civil service proposals, the participants promote their proposals in their local communities and collect signatures. So if their proposals get support from at least 3% of the community, they are referred to public servants for scrutiny, scrutiny and development. In the last stage, the final deliber deliberation, the community assembly meets again to revise the changes made by the public servants. Through the last process, the proposal went into a legislative language, so now it's ensured that the proposal could be ready for implementation. In the last step, they're sending the proposal to the local council for deliberation. In this final meeting is also a nexus for the next round of the assembly, so two participants are elected to take part as moderators in the next assembly. This ensures that previous experiences don't get lost and can be used further on. We want to add an optional online forum during the first deliberation, as you can see now, um, so that all residents of the local community can give their input online to support the community assembly. Overall, our proposed community assembly can be a useful tool against democratic disenchantment through the inclusion of citizens in the democratic process. And last, please check out our homepage and there you find further information, our working papers, our public, uh, our proposals and our conference reports. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, Wonderful presentation and uh, their audience, you should remember that now Lisa and the other authors of this policy brief, they met for the first time, uh, I mean, some time ago and, and came up with the, with, with the basic set of proposals. And then they are studying very hard in the university uh, programs and they are doing different uh, active engagement in, in various settings. And at the same time, in parallel to everything else, they keep up this very thorough work of, of developing their proposals, which ends up in such a, uh, such a policy brief as the one that Lisa has presented now. It is really impressive, and the energy and the, the, the drive and the, the capacity that you have, and this is, sets an example for the future, I think, and extremely valuable. So thank you, Lisa, for doing this. And now, uh, dear audience, uh, you will have the chance to pitch in your comments, your views, your thoughts, and we will do this by inviting uh, Eric, uh, John and Lisa on stage. And I will ask first you in the room, and you will have the chance, three of you, to, to pose questions or comments. And afterwards, we will see if we have anyone who are online, and then I will represent them if they send questions to me. So three uh, questions slash comments in a row, and the, pa and the panelists will, will, will respond to that. So uh, who want to start? And for that matter, we have help by, by Lisa uh, Lundgren, who is sitting uh, down, down here in the, in the room. Lisa happens to be one of the participants of last year's conference. So she's one of the hardworking ones. She will go around and give you the chance to speak in the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation, all of you. I was uh, curious about, uh, I get what you portray as the problem that people perceived uh, representative democracy to be less legitimate and so on. And I see a lot of the solutions that are proposed via the representative assemblies. But I was curious what the participants in the think tank or the research that you 
uh, gathered together. What is the view about what the cause of this problem is? Why is democracy less representative? Is it that the politicians don't know what's going on so that the assemblies can give them information about what people care about? Is it that the politicians don't uh, care, so the assemblies will force them to care somehow? Or what kind of, what is the more specific cause or root problem that people think that this can address, basically? Thank you. So, what do you say, panelists? That is a very good and interesting question, of course, and very hard to answer. Um, Personally, I um, I think that the the demands uh, on democracy have increased, and uh, both in terms of the challenges, but also in terms of how people think. It's not like uh, we don't we don't run in uh, packs anymore. If you want to express it like that, it's like uh, the the politics of yesterday. We, we could sort of align with the different teams and ascribe to their worldview, but we're not there any longer, I think. Uh, and that, that raises the demands and, and makes representative democracy somewhat lacking. I would just um, answer the part of what we thought at the conference in 2019. Um, it was a time where we could see a rise of radical parties everywhere, and that was what made us sad and what why we were thinking about okay we need to have an idea how can we change it how can we get more people to vote for the moderate parties and don't go with extremist ideas and this is how we started this proposal yeah it's a big question of course and i could only touch on a few things but uh, as eric said the the fragmentation of political parties now things have become much more individualized Parties have lost their kind of group uh, dynamic, and uh, that all, all goes with 40 years of neoliberalization. Neo then you have um, the kind of rise of technocratic, the kind of centrist consensus in the 90s, and uh, that, that really kind of erased the differences between uh, left and right. And then you also have the, the kind of uh, failure of the left to back up their ideals with real policies. So there's a lack of imagination there or a lack of will on, I think, all around. Um, yeah, and, and it's a bit different now with uh, r the rise of the right wing and polarization. So you have a lot of engagement, but it's polarized. Um, that's the, those are the main strokes, I think. Thank you. So, more questions. Jeff, we have another one. Hello, everyone. Stefan Ludien is my name. I work in the city of Gothenburg with democracy issues. Um, I work as a civil servant, but nonetheless, this will be a. I, I wonder about the costs. I, I, because, in my opinion, when they did this in Finland, Orb, I guess, um, they, they measure right kind of expensive costs. So what's your elevator pitch about that? What's to say to the politicians so that we can do this? I think that's one for you two guys, actually. Do you want to start, Lisa? Yeah, I just have a sad answer to that. Um, of course, we're all students, we're all young people, we kind of idealistic perspectives. Um, and we did not calculate any costs for that because we have like, yeah, our screen is not big enough to think about how much that could be. But it's a really important point we have to think about and I'm sure we will discuss this in the next weeks. <laughs> so thank you for the input. Thanks for your question. Uh, it definitely is an issue that comes up in research. Um, they... It's, it shows the importance of formal institutionalization because once you create these infrastructures for these processes, there's less of a startup cost, you could say. Um, and then if you, combine, if you have to compare the cost of not having these assemblies with you know, societal 
crises and failures to of politicians to actually adequately uh, address uh, these many crises we, we're in. So if you have you have to balance a look at the performance and the potential of these assemblies, actually, it's a it's a relatively low cost if you if you make this this uh, equation. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, having more questions, yes. Yes, as a participant, a participant of the IYC conference um, in 2020, which had to be held online due to Corona, um, I thought if doing such deliberative processes online could be an option or could be also a challenge because we perfectly know that coming together in person is much more productive, but we were uh, productive um, anyhow doing this online. So maybe this could also be a point for um, cheaper costs, um, in, in fact, even if it has downsides, that's not the question. But maybe, yes, you can also think this is as a possibility. Another question up front. And meanwhile, I could make a comment about the thing about the cost. We know that from a populist perspective, there have been massive arguments that politicians and their bureaucrats are so expensive that they are kind of gaining themselves economically from running a democratic system. So I think that, and I mean, we could debate to what extent that is a valid criticism, but I think since community assemblies is about giving the chance for citizens, so to give them, I mean, to make the argument about the costliness, you could say, well, we could transfer a little bit of, of, of the cost that typically otherwise would go to bureaucrats and, and the politicians. Part of it should be go to citizens, to giving them the, the, the actual possibility of, of exercising in citizenship. So, so I don't think that, and, and because that is the part, part of the problematic situation that ordinary people, citizens, wouldn't feel represented or, or, or treated in a good way. So I think we could twist that around. The cost, cost thing could be to the advantage. It, cost, it is costly to engage citizens, and that is a good thing. So I think that is the most important answer. Next question, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for three very interesting presentations. I was thinking of one ongoing sort of example of this in Chile, where the, which seems to tick all your boxes uh, in a way, where the citizens have elected an assembly of citizens who are going to elaborate a proposal for a new constitution, the first constitution since Pinochet, actually, so it's, it's a huge task. And from what I understood, the, it is very well representative, men, women, people from indigenous communities, and so on. And the, the whole uh, process will result in a referendum uh, by everybody. So this seems to take kind of your, the boxes that you have, ha have elaborated. Now, this is ongoing, of course, and, and I don't know the timetable, but probably another year or two until this. Uh, so I don't know if you have had any possibility to look at this, because this is really putting your theory into an interesting practice. And what do you think about that? John, do you? That's, that's uh, too recent for my radar. But I know there was uh, uh, an assembly that was part of developing, I think it was the Icelandic constitution, uh, the similar process. I, I can't speak to the Chilean uh, example, but maybe I could say that these, uh, it's it perhaps uh, points to a risk of institutionalization because uh, you, well, I included talking about ad hoc or one-time uh, assemblies because uh, it's important to kind of reserve the right to, to gather and call one of these assemblies from, from the public's point of view um, as opposed to uh, these bigger institutionalized ones that are so weighted toward these huge issues. I hope it's successful. I, I can't speak to it though. Sorry. And more questions from the floor? In the back, yes. Um, yes, I thank you to all three of you for your presentations. 
Um, I was just wondering about uh, the scale of it, um, or, or better said, on the uh, uh, on what levels we are talking. We can have s um, citizen assemblies on a local level. We can have them on national levels. Where are the differences? Where is it most effective? Should we have it on all levels? Should we? What what are the uh, what are the benefits of having them here or there? Um, and especially towards your policy brief, did you have something th certain in mind? Were you more thinking on the on the local level? Because you were also talking about um, then going to the public, getting three percent of the people to to sign on on these ideas, um, and also towards the policy brief, um, did you have any ideas on how to institutionally? anchor your policy brief. Uh, I think you didn't touch on that as much. Thank you. Can I directly start? Um, the scale should be on a really local level because we think that's the best starting point. If we see in some years that that would work really well, we can go on the higher levels, but we were thinking really of city parts or villages or other areas like that to include the people in like the questions they have in their everyday life, which is important for their local community and not the big questions we have or we have like with the constitution in Chile. Um, how to institutionalize this? That's a really good question, but we think we can first start with trying this out. How does that work? Give it some years in some villages or city parts to try it out and then maybe find a way to bring it in a regional constitutions or something like that. That would be amazing, but I would say this is a dream. I think we should try it out in really small areas first. It's a good question. Um, generally, it's recommended to have the assembly at the most appropriate level to the issue being deliberated. Uh, but as things are more and more interconnected at different scales, that can shift. Um, there's a case I talk about in the paper, I think in Brazil, where they start at the local level and then step up, up and up to the national level as a, in a long process. Uh, Landamore, who I referenced, she recommends uh, having a sufficient amount in terms of the total amount that each citizen has a, a high enough percentage chance of being selected. So there's a certain amount of what she calls democratic representation. If you know you'll never be selected, or if you know you'll have a chance of being selected, that it changes your mindset about it, I think. Um, uh, so, but the levels should be integrated and talk to each other. Um, but it is important, I think, to have multiple levels. More questions from the audience? You're so full of, of thinking about the, these potentials. Another question we have here, actually, perfect. Yeah, I mean, concerning the policy brief, again, um, with institutionalizing it, my question was also on how you're getting the ideas into policies later. I mean, you were talking about the final uh, step of deliberation. Um, and then these ideas or the proposals are already supposed to be in a, in a format that fits to become policy. But how are we going to make the politicians in, in the end uh, put the policies into practice? Um, and I mean, m my idea was, uh, which, which might be as well interesting, whether it would be good to combine it with referendums in general, We're having th this idea of um, uh, uh, groups of pe uh, the, the assemblies and, and the assemblies always ending in referendums, similar as we saw it in Ireland, I think, with, with the big national uh, assembly. Um, in that way, also, again, not only integrating those people within the uh, assembly, but integrating the whole of the population and in that way making it more representative. Because, I mean, otherwise we could also talk about in general getting rid of representative democracy and just having these policy, uh, these, these assemblies. I guess with, for me, the, the, the first, the biggest problem there being yeah, people feeling left out because their chance of getting into this assembly is that small. But with this combination of referendum and assembly, 
there being the possibility of everyone being part of it in the end. Yeah, we were thinking about these signature parts so that you should get 3% of the community signing the proposal. And with that, it's sent to the local council for deliberation. So it's kind of a proposal which is already in a form that it can be a law, but of course, the local council has to decide on it. But we have the idea or the hope that the local council takes this proposal to their heart and really discusses it uh, beyond their uh, party lines so that they see, okay, it's an important topic for the people in this area. We should think about it now if so many people think this is important. We should properly discuss it and maybe make it to a law. That was the idea we had um, behind this. I think I did not answer your last part of the question now, or did I answer it? regarding a referendum at the end. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, you could add that, but we thought about this could be a good starting point again, and hopefully it's enough pressure for the local councils to make it to a law. So, thank you. Now we have two questions from the online audience. So, one question is, do we know why people are leaning towards more radical IDs and so why radical IDs among people and the second one how would you handle possible citizens uh, taking part in an assembly that have extremist views or even just are against the establishment why do you think that people turn radical and how would you handle an assembly if the people are extremist or are just plainly against the establishment. You want to start? Perfect. I, I would start with the second question with the extremist views in an assembly. Um, as said before, we always have two moderators. And of course, as in every discussion, as we have it here, there are some rules. And if anyone is against these rules or is constantly um, yeah, playing against and just sharing extremist views which are not constructive, this will not end up in a proposal because the overall people have a different opinion and as I said, if a person is playing against the rules, they of course can't take part in it. Like if any one of you would run around screaming, I'm sure you would be asked to leave the room. So it's, I would say it's like normal, normal discussions. I will just add more to the second question. Um, with assemblies, with democracy, you need a kind of what's called a meta consensus, an agreement on the kind of, to accept the results, to accept, accept disagreement. Um, there was a misconception in earlier generations of research that deliberative process should go towards a consensus, towards one uh, recommendation, for instance, but Assemblies can actually produce multiple recommendations and the idea with deliberation and with that is that uh, it makes more transparent, more clear what the different perspectives are. So even a, a radical view or an extremist view could be, it should be welcomed perhaps and if within the meta consensus and perhaps that they come up with a recommendation that becomes one of multiple that the public can then take and evaluate. Um, as to why people are becoming more radical in their views. That's a, another big question. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with uh, the build up to the centrist consens consens consensus, so the end of history, the failure of the left, etc. But there are other factors, um, conspiracy theory, things, and so on. Maybe. Well, I could add uh, something just. Um... Why do people turn radical? Well, do they really? I'm not sure. Uh, it's uh, it's an open question. I don't. I, I'm, I'm not sure people are more radical today than they they used to be. Um, and maybe it's the wrong question, uh, or rather, the right question is what what should we do with with radical views, and how do we incorporate them in in the political discussion? Because we need to do that because 
if we don't, then their only option is violence, basically. So uh, I think that's a more important question to ask. How do we, how do we um, not solve them or, or get rid of them, but rather how do we incorporate them? How do we bring in the radical questions and how do we uh, answer them? So thank you, Eric, and thank you, Lisa, and thank you, John, for great presentations, for taking comments. Thank you, dear audience, you who are present in El Rumet and you who have been online. This has been a, a really good uh, lunch um, event, and we are hoping that you will come back again. On October 6th is our next Lindholmen Democracy Talks, and that will be on matter of truth. Because last year's youth conference, one of the really strong uh, issues which were discussed is that truth is a problem of our times. So the youth, they proposed a global charter for truth, that the UN should do something about truthfulness in the world. And uh, during the course of, year, of the year that has been running, it's now uh, condensed into a policy brief proposal which is proposing journalistic Im immunity to protect journalists so that they could protect democracy. So they are actually saying if the UN has been peacekeeping in the world, it should now be truth keeping. So come to us on October 6th, the same place, the same venue, the same IYTT, and you will learn more. And we are so eager to learn more from you because of the dialogue. So thank you very much now. Have a good day and a good weekend and uh, look forward to see you again. Bye bye.